Yeah. So what's the next couple of games you guys have got? I know at the end of the month, uh, next month, you've got Melbourne Victory, which is going to be interesting. So uh, It's, um, it's a really strange because uh, we've got six weeks now without a home game. Yeah. Um, um, it's something that uh, we talked about at the beginning of the season, how we're going to handle it. And Popovich obviously has got his, uh, his views. But uh, yeah, it's not good for the fans. That's what I'm more worried about is getting bums on seats. And, yeah. and then the AFL did us a favour by putting the Eagles head to head. So, you know, we know 3,000 of our members are Eagles members. It's the first home game for the Eagles. So, you know, that's 3,000 less people straight away. So it's not going to be good. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So there's a direct crossover there with Eagles fans. I wasn't aware of those numbers. That's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. 3,000 of our members uh, are Eagles fans. And oh. I think there's a couple of thousand Dockers uh, of, of Glory members. Yeah, yeah. So we will crash through 11,000 members, though, for the first time in our history um, coming up. Uh, we believe we'll do it before the uh, victory game. But, uh, yeah, head-to-head. Yeah, head. If it wasn't their first game of the season, uh, the Eagles, and remember they've only got 11 home games, so if you buy your membership there, you want to go to every game. Mm, mm. And, uh, I mean, their memberships are – I'm a member uh, – <laughs> Uh, it's about eight hundred bucks for yeah. eleven games. It's increasing every year. Two hundred and fifty yeah. bucks for fourteen games. Yeah, so it's yeah. a big difference. So yeah. if you're going to miss one, which one would you miss? So that's it. Probably that's the Eagles game. I would. Yeah, and I'm going to, and I've got to box it, Optus. <laughs> that's it. If you had a box seat, though, you know, yeah. No, nah, still go to the glory. <laughs> that's it. <Yeah. laughs> that's commitment. That's good. I mean, yeah, you'd expect it, but um, I wanted to, I mean, some of these questions are probably a bit rudimentary and you've you know, gone through the motions, or well, not so much, but um, I wanted to get your thoughts on what's been um, some of the critical factors you think in the success that the team's had this season, you know, well, to go from finishing eighth last season to... Yeah, that, sec- that last game against uh, Brisbane last season, um, if we'd won that, we would have made the finals, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we weren't far off the finals, but it, it's a completely different side. It's a completely different mentality. Uh, I think the players that Popovich has brought in has brought into his system. Um, say we didn't have Popovich, Popovich as coach, we wouldn't have got a Kotomides, Baranovic, Davidson, Franich. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, been huge. Players. So, so he's um, uh, brought those players in. They wanted to play for him. Uh, Kotomides has already been a, a huge star. He got picked up for the Socceroos. Um, so that was his goal. Come mm. play under Popovich and you'll play for the Socceroos. I think Speranovic, because he was injured, uh, he might get a crack in the next uh, uh, six months at the Socceroos. Uh, and then again, Davidson, he's been a revelation at left back. So, mm. uh, so number one, the players. Uh, number two, a completely different professional uh, professionalism. Um, I don't think in my time there's been that many double sessions at the club. Uh, the players used to come training and go home, uh, come in, do a weight session, but uh, you know, they get in at uh, eight o'clock and they leave at five o'clock, like any professional footballer around the world. Fantastic, yeah. So it's completely different. Uh, Popper himself is intense. Uh, he brings that intensity. Um, now he wanted to cover every single posse with uh, a similar like player. And uh, so there's competition for places. Mm. Now, if you look at the changes he's rung in in the last six to ten weeks um, and you go under previous coaches, I won't mention them by name, it's more or less a fixed 11, basically for the whole season. The only way you wouldn't get uh, a game is if, you pl- is if you're injured. Yep. So that's completely different uh, under Popovich. If you don't train well, even if you're the best player, you're not going to get a game on the weekend. So names don't matter as much. Yep. Not to him, no. That's, and that's you good. can see mm. by the amount of players that have been dropped, uh, well, not dropped, but uh, you know, just don't make the squad uh, over there. And Keogh's sat on the bench. Uh, Kilkenny sat on the bench. Uh, obviously, uh, Kianese sat on the bench, but Speranovic is sat on the bench. Uh, and the maestro, uh, Castro, sat on the bench. So all of them wanted to play. All of them thought they could play. Yeah. Uh, but Popovich is... Uh, laid down the, the rules and uh, they all have to abide by it. So there's a healthy le- level of hunger amongst the players to, to be in that starting 11 and when they get their chance. I mean, Scotty Neville came in and 
first touch, I think he whipped it off and we've got a goal from that. So, I mean, is that does that kind of speak to the, co- the level of competition between the players? And Yeah, from my point of view, it does. Uh, they've got to be ready. And I think Popper says that all the time to the players. You've got to be ready. And Neville, when he got the goal, got the um, cross, the f- he ran to the bench. He didn't run to any of the players on the pitch. He ran to the bench. One, he's got an affinity with all the bench players. Mm. Uh, but you know, the, f- the first person he came across was, uh, was Papa. Uh, hugged him first. But, yeah, you know, that's the sort of camaraderie we've got in the group. They're there to do a job, uh, no matter whether how long they sit on the bench or if they're f- in the uh, first 11. Yeah, brilliant. Um, just if you want to try and just if you can try and keep that about a fist length away. Um, so, I know you guys from la- last year. You guys um, picked up Tony Pinato as the CEO. I think he was pretty instrumental uh, attracting Alessandro Del Piero to Sydney FC. I wanted to get an idea. How much do you think that coup for him speaks to his character? And ability in that role, and then what do you think he's been able to bring into the club this season? Uh, look, it's uh, it's different with CEOs. That they um, really under the reign of Tony Popovich, he's uh, the CEO hasn't got much to do with the playing group other than yeah. vet the contracts. So his role more has been a calming influence, uh, dealing with the FFA on certain issues. Like for example, I'll give you one: we did the Central Coast Brisbane trip. Uh, we didn't want to come all the way back and go again. So we needed someone like Tony to go in there and say, look, it's stupid. Mm. Uh, why don't you pay for the accommodation that for the whole squad? We flew to Sydney, busted up to Central Coast, back to Sydney, flew up to Brisbane, and we stayed on the, uh, at Bris- on the Sunshine Coast. That was all arranged. Uh, never happened really much before, but that's the type of uh, uh, relationship he has with the FFA because of his history. Uh, knows the people in there, and he can arrange something like that. Uh, on the ground here, he's brought his own uh, commercial team, and yeah. uh, we're kicking goals on that front as well. That travelling for WA teams is always over east. It's always they always think it's kind of exaggerated, but it really is quite a taxing journey. Yeah, going look, back and forwards. I've had many conversations with many of the different uh, codes as well. I mean, I, I remember uh, Malthouse when he came out. Oh yeah, uh, and he did not believe the the wear and tear uh, on the bodies, and I think he cut out. It said a WA player would, uh, well, an Eagles uh, or Dockers player would last a lot less in the AFL than the normal AFL player playing in Melbourne. Mm, yeah. uh, in the nineties, he said that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've talked to Ross Lyon, says the same thing, and Tony Popovich uh, only made a few trips to, to Perth and he didn't. He just shrugged his shoulders. Oh, yeah, it's a part of the game. But now he has to travel every week or every second week. Uh, he has found it a lot uh, more difficult than he first thought. Um, so, yes, it is a hindrance, but we want to be in the national competition. So we have to put up with it. No WA team uh, is exempt. Uh, it just goes to show if you do win it, um, and we're luckier than the AFL if we make the grand final, we uh, like the Eagles were top last year. They had to go to Melbourne for the grand final. <laughs> if we're top this year, we play at Optus. Yep. So uh, you know that is the advantage of uh, our game compared to the AFL. So that'll be a huge advantage. That's why we've got to maintain our lead, uh, eight points at the moment. We've got to maintain it right throughout the, the end of the season to get that home ground advantage for the finals. It's a worthy challenge. Yeah, that's it. I mean, all things going well this month. Oh, sorry, next month. Um, you could be in a pretty good position, you know, with a couple of wins and then especially if you can sort of knock back Melbourne victory and and push yourself clear even more. Yeah, you just don't think about that though. I mean, one thing I've learned under Tony Popovich, don't look ahead. Uh, I said uh, about eight weeks ago, our big game was Melbourne victory in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago. Uh, And uh, Tony uh, shot me down and said, no, no, no. But anyway, that ended up being a very, very good six-point game for us. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got to really get past uh, Melbourne City uh, next week. Um, and yep. that's the f- sole focus. We had a completely disappointing uh, last 20 minutes uh, in Sydney last weekend. Uh, Popper will certainly address that uh, during the week. And, uh, you know, some people have come up and said, oh, look, that'll give the boys uh, a nice uh, kick in the pants and uh, they won't let their guard down again. But in the end, I'd prefer the two points and then... Uh, having their guard <laughs> taken down. 
Um, that would have put us 10 points clear, and I, I believe at 10 points it would have been unassailable. Yeah. But uh, Sydney's got a uh, – there's no easy games in the A-League, but Sydney's got a, a slightly better draw than us going, and they're only eight points behind. So we've got a win uh, mm. against the teams like Melbourne City. If I lost in the last 30 seconds, I'd want to win like 10-0 the next game. Yeah. Well, that's, oh, yeah. That'll be Send me into a rage. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. That'll be the, the motivation. Yeah, and it was a sloppy goal as well. I mean, uh, you know, and I, I, you'd – can't really blame the keeper. He didn't see it till late. Yeah. Um, it was sort of through a bunch of legs. But, you know, he should have never been able to get the shot away, in my opinion. Yeah. And the referee should have blown it 30 seconds earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so definitely that like, sort of last 20 minute period seemed a bit dull. And there, there was a sense as I was watching it as well, like, you know, one nil lead here just wasn't quite enough. Um, and yeah, obviously, Bus parked. Ah, uh, sort of. Not so much, but um, still trying to play the way we wanted to, but just not looking as sharp as we could have been. No, no, we definitely weren't sharp in that last twenty. And, and, and uh, parking the bus may be a bit overstated, but what we didn't do was press forward as much as we had the the previous seventy minutes. So yeah. I really noticed that. They, you know, you you saw uh, Kianese and Castro. Uh, especially they were right back in our defensive uh, half when um, you know there could have been a lot of through balls going through and putting pressure on them so they didn't have so many in our half. So that was more more my point. Uh, so it was a, a, a lax. Uh, Popovich didn't plan it that way. Um, so it's just a player's mentality, tiredness uh, as well. So, um, yeah, but let's just hope it won't happen again. But let's go back a few years. If we got a point away, we'd be screaming with delight. Mm. Yeah. Now, we haven't lost a game all season away, uh, so that's a fantastic uh, record that he's got. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I remember even last year, if we got a point away from home, that was uh, very, very good. Yeah, certainly. It's all, we were in, definitely in a state of um, uh, almost this entitled expectations now because of the success that we're having. And, yeah, you do need to sort of check yourself and kind of keep that perspective as well. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, I think it is a good outcome. So that's now 11 games undefeated in the A-League, which is a club record in the A-League. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's still pretty... Oh, it's still very, very, very good. good. I mean, eight points clear, uh, 11 uh, unbeaten. Um, but the team has got high expectations, especially Liam Reddy at the back. He hates not having a clean sheet. Uh, mm. This year will be a record for us, I think, in clean sheets. So he's only got to get one more. Um but, uh, yeah, the, the, the team is definitely focused on little things. Like the first thing is a clean sheet. And when they do get something scored against them, that the whole defensive line does get a bit upset. Yeah. Yeah. How do they respond, do you think, uh, to that as well? Does it, does it sort of – because I know if, you, if you're getting a lot of clean sheets uh, and then you concede, can that um, – I don't know. Can you? Can that because you're not used to being scored against in that situation? Can it? Can you be a bit out of touch with how to respond to that scenario? And kind of can it dampen your spirits more so than actually? I think that's up to the coach and the mentality that he brings to the side. I mean, at training they're just going to go through hell uh, on on practicing if something like that happens again. So, but don't forget also. I mean, our back line hasn't really been settled. What is our back three four? I mean, Grant has played excellent all season. He's been injured. Uh, Tommy Mitchell has been excellent. He's been injured. So, you know, we've got a, a situation in the back four or five, whichever way he wants to play, three, four or five, that you've got uh, Neville, you've got Lowry, you've got Speranovic, you've got Dino Jubilic and the two injured players. Uh, and uh, so it's going to be very, very interesting what uh, Tony's top 11, and especially in that back four or five, uh, is going to be picked over the next uh, four or five weeks. So I think Tommy's out of injury uh, and he trains fully with the squad this week and Grant is about another two weeks away. Yeah. Um, a, good ad- a good headache to have. Mm. Yeah, so. certainly. I know going back a little bit earlier in the season, you guys had a pretty busy run of games um, and it really tested the depth of the squad, which I think came through successfully there and that's kind of... Was that a bit of a pivotal point in the season just to sort of see like, I guess I, when a team's playing well, in my opinion, 
one of the last sort of tests for that side is well, how, what is the depth of your squad? Because at some point during the season, it's it's going to be tested, and it's like, can can you ride it out? Do you have the guys ready to go that can come in and do a job, or is it going to let you down, sort of thing? And I think, how do you sort of feel about the depth of the squad this oh, season? Look, I think it's excellent when you've got players of the ilk um, of you know we Brandon Wilson played virtually when Castro was uh, unfit the whole it started, and I think seven or eight games. Mm. He, he can't get into the squad at the moment. Uh, does anyone remember Chrissy Harold? Yeah, he hasn't, oh, yeah. hasn't played all season. Um, so he had a bit of an injury uh, up front, played I think one and a half uh, games, can't get into the squad. Uh, so the, the depth is there. You've got players on the sidelines that aren't getting a game. Um, and I think that's fantastic uh, they're, they're very good squad players as well. I mean, they come to every game. They're part of the, the squad. Um, so there's no disharmony, if you like, if you can get that situation in, in some teams. But because we're winning, I suppose, and they all want to get into that side. So the training uh, is intense. And we've had a few uh, injuries at training uh, because of that. So, But, yeah, I mean, uh, though I've just mentioned two. There's obviously others that haven't made uh, the, the, the starting 16 or 17 on the bench as well. Uh, so the depth of the squad, I think, has be, been the best since I've been at the club. Yeah, yeah, it definitely feels that way. So no set hierarchy sort of fosters a lot of confidence no. in whoever comes yeah, there's in. No, yeah, yeah, there's no set hierarchy. Tony will pick, as I said earlier in the, in the conversation, uh, whoever he thinks is training the best. Yeah. and uh, looks at the opposition as well. I mean, does they match up with that opposition? So, uh, yeah, uh, very, very good depth. And, again, it's a credit to him. He brought the players here. Yeah. Um, breezing through a few topics at the moment, uh, I know the A-League's set to expand to 12 teams in the 2019-2020 season. You've made a few comments around where that expansion should take place. I was just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about your motivation behind making those comments and what the, like the feasibility of such an expansion could be? Yeah, look, uh, I, I think you've got to think outside the box. I mean, you know, having another team in Melbourne, is that going to take fans away from Victory and City? Another team in Sydney, is they going to take fans away from Western Sydney, Sydney FC and the two up uh, north, on the northern coast? So, and even if we have a team here in Perth, I mean, will Perth Glory fans um, defect? Uh, what happened with the Eagles when the Dockers started, two or 3,000 Eagles fans moved across. So it does dilute your own market. We've got 300 million people directly to our north that are football mad uh, in Indonesia, in Singapore, in Malaysia and in uh, Philippines. I can't see why that you shouldn't start the conversation, and that's what I've done, uh, and say let's have a team in Jakarta, let's have a team in Singapore, let's have a team in Malaysia. Um, just going on broad numbers, just to give you an idea, uh, there's rusted on about 2 million AFL viewers. They got 2.5 billion over six years. Um, we all have 300 million extra viewers coming from uh, those four countries. Now, how much is money is that going to bring in broadcast rights? Now, there's say there's 12 teams in Australia, four over there, That's we'll get... Uh, 12 sixteenths of that three four hundred million dollars a year rather than sharing 12 clubs now with uh, 60 million dollars a year in broadcast rights so I think it's got to happen I think uh, the um, uh, the way of the future would be to bring in teams from over there uh, they'd like to join our competition their own competitions aren't that strong uh, and it will develop their younger players uh, as well and their grassroots if they do have a team in a Asian competition, whether we call it the A-League or the Asian League, who knows. But you've got to have that conversation. To me, I don't think the extra team in Melbourne and the extra team in Sydney will increase uh, the broadcast rights too much, and that's what we all live off. Yeah, so it's just sort of going to cannibalise a oversaturated market. I, I believe so. Yeah. Um, but the powers at the FFA uh, don't believe that. But. So, so that might be alluding to my next comment, which would be there, are there not any talks on the FFA's behalf that you're aware of to investigate the potential to expand into Asia? Because I know you're sort of, the talks at the moment are coming off your own back or... Yeah, well, look, um, to appease me, they've given me permission to play one game 
a year from uh, well from last year uh, in Asia. So we're investigating, only investigating at this stage, whether we can host one of our home games next year in either Kuala Lumpur or in Singapore, just as a test to see and gauge the interest uh, in in that country for a league action. Yep. Um, and uh, I think I'd like to do that. Uh, I've got to now go ahead and start the process. Number one, you've got to talk to the broadcaster. How much is that going to cost to send a broadcast team over there extra? Uh, you've got to talk to the leagues in either Kuala Lumpur or Singapore, or Malaysia and Singapore. I've done that. Both of them would love to host a, an A-League game. The last step, obviously, is to talk to an A-League club who wants to go up and play us up there. Yeah. You need their permission. Have you had any talks to anyone or would there be anyone that's putting their hand up? Or? I have. I've had a talk to Central Coast. Uh, they'd love to do it. Uh, and Excellent. Uh, Brisbane. Yeah. So both owners I know really well and both would uh, would love a chance to play up there. For, and, you know, it's not much further uh, yeah. than Perth. Uh, going to, to those, it's an extra two hours. Mm. Is there already huge support for the, for the game in general in Asia as well, especially with the AFL going up to... Uh, China, that that that's not even a support that's supported in those countries. But I feel like it's a no-brainer to bring soccer up. Yeah, there. well, well not bring soccer up there, but bring yeah, them, yeah, bring our teams up there. Yeah, yeah, look, it is. I mean, the Wildcats um, did it for a while. Um, they played three or four home games uh, up there over a couple of years. Then uh, NBL team from Singapore, the Singapore Slings. I don't know if you remember, they were in the league for a year or so. Then the league just dropped away. Yeah. yeah. So it does work. It does bring in. Uh, we'd be a great test case to see how many, what sort of crowd we get and what sort of TV numbers we get up there as well as uh, back here in Australia. So, look, I think it's worth trying. And, I, and uh, I've let Tony Pinata know what I want. And uh, he has to now go and deliver and get a game up there. We've obviously got to raise some money to do it. We need a sponsor because there is extra costs rather than playing here in Perth. What do you think is the hesitancy on the FFA's part on, uh, this, on this sort of issue? Yeah, look, uh, with the teams um, uh, from those countries, you would need AFC approval. So I think that's their hesitancy. They don't think that they will achieve that approval. Now, for me, I don't think that's a problem. The AFC already let wellington in our competition and wellington's not even part of asia so mm. they're letting another team from outside of a confederation to play in our league so i wouldn't why wouldn't they let teams from within our confederation that aren't strong football uh, uh leagues in their own countries yeah. uh, join so the conversation has got to be had at some point and um, i will be pushing it and the time to push it obviously is when the league becomes independent of the ffa yeah and the distance travelled probably wouldn't be too much of a question because obviously already coming from Wellington. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah Wellington up. to here. Like I said, it's an extra two hours for every team on the East Coast instead of coming to Perth, going to Singapore or Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. It all makes sense to me. Um, what did the FFA stand to lose from attempting to... Uh, credibility, I suppose. They've always said that it won't work and uh, if they actually got off their asses and tried... Um, to, to talk to the AFC, they might find there is a different answer that, than they expect. So I, I think it's, I mean, call it laziness. They've got other issues that they want to deal with. It all goes back to what I believe is uh, the lack of interest the FFA has shown in the A-League. I don't know, you guys are, are, are football fans, and how many times have you seen an advertisement for a glory game in the West or in the Sunday Times or for that matter, on free-to-air television. Now, I've been here 14 years, I've seen none. Mm. So they don't promote the A-League in Perth. Now, I know for a fact they don't do it in Adelaide either. I know for a fact they don't do it in Brisbane. The only markets they seem to promote is Melbourne and Sydney. Yeah. Uh, and the blockbusters, you know, the, the derbies between the, uh, the, the Sydney FC and Wanderers and Melbourne City and Melbourne Victory. We had, a, or we had the biggest crowd at Amy Park this year Perth Glory versus Melbourne Victory. No publicity. Yeah. So the fans knew it was a big game and yep. they just came. But that is the biggest criticism that we've got. Um, the other one is in, in uh, 14 years that uh, the Lowys were in charge of the um, FFA, 
not one of them, either chairman, came to a Perth Glory game, A-League game. Yeah. Now, that's an indictment. But I've also found out from the Adelaide owner, they never went to Adelaide. And I found out from the Brisbane owner, other than the grand final, they never went to Brisbane. So they has led from the top the two chairmen of the A-League, the FFA, never came to a game in Perth. And that's a sad indictment that's of the game. It's too hard on their recovery <laughs> to fly back. Correct. It's too far. Correct. But it just shows you, yeah. that, I mean, it, it, it's terrible to say that. I mean, I don't want to ha- hit them when they're down because they've been kicked out now. But, you know, the reason they were kicked out is because of that. They just so f- um, Sydney and Melbourne centric Yeah. Uh, that uh, they just did not want to fly to Perth. Uh, they came to Perth, obviously, for a Matildas or a Socceroos game. But that's it. That's not coming to Perth to watch Perth yeah. Glory play an A League game, which I think is not only sad; it's just it's it's just an indictment on them. Yeah, it's always it's always felt like that that there is a bit of a sense that the Melbourne Sydney are coddled a lot, and that especially from Perth's point of view, from our point of view, we sort of have to do a lot of legwork to try and keep pace with you know what's going on over there. Um, we're kind of left on the wayside. Um, but uh, there is something, there is a mentality, I think, that's born out of that that dynamic, I think, that's quite honourable, that's um, sort of something you could attribute to Perth Glory, which is a, a fighting attitude and a, a willingness to, to stamp our name out there and stuff like that. I'm yeah, probably well, reaching for something here, but I it, agree. No, yeah, it yeah, feels well, that way. Yeah, look, it's um, also I've been outspoken and uh, they probably don't like me as a person or personally uh, because I <laughs> am them. outspoken. Yeah. I, I, I say what I, uh, what's on my mind and I, I think we've been hard done by here in the West. I mean, just going on uh, one point, um, the travel. Um, Sydney FC, Newcastle, Central Coast and Western Sydney, now a new club coming up. They don't fly for 12 mm. games because they play each other. Mm. They just take a bus. There's no accommodation cost. Right now, under the FFA rules, I have to pay for accommodation, not the league. They play for most of the FAs, only 21 out of the 25 we send. So I'm out of pocket on travel and accommodation, 380 grand a year by default. By default, Sydney's is 80. Now mm-hmm. that's two players. Now a lot of the fans and a lot of the people that uh, watch the sport don't realise that's two full players that I'm paying. Extra, so that's three hundred grand difference, right? That's two players that I could have hired better than what. So poor coaches before Popovich came along only had a budget three hundred less than Sydney FC, Newcastle Central Coast. Now Brisbane have a similar problem; they have to fly as well, but they only stay one night, and so does Melbourne when they go up, and so does Adelaide. Yeah, because of the flights, no flight comes back after eight o'clock. We play a four and seven o'clock game; we can't get to the airport. So we have to get there. And so we have to pay two nights accommodation for 26 people. So that's why our bill is so large compared to every other A-League club. Now, it doesn't happen in the AFL. doesn't happen in the NRL. doesn't happen in the NBL. It doesn't happen in the Claxton Shield. I know, my, I know the Perth Heat owners very well. They uh, ask them the question. doesn't happen with the Warriors. doesn't happen with the Scorchers uh, and all the female teams as well. Why does it happen in football? It's just not fair. Yeah. Every other sport has an equalisation account or the league pays. Now, everyone out there will just say, well, you know, you're from WA, you have to put up with it. We don't have to put up with it. No other sport does put up with it, but we've had to. You add 14 years, it's two, three, four million dollars extra that I've had to pay. I wasn't aware that the the, the other other leagues didn't have to. No, the the other leagues, you get paid all your travel. And your accommodation, so airfares right. and accommodation. Ours, they pay for 21 to travel. We, we typically have to send more because of injuries and that training, so we send 23 or 24 players and coaches. Um, and we have to pay for two nights on each one. And it's a lot of money when you add it up, and you add it up over 14 years that I've been owner. So th- I am incensed about that, have been all the way through, um, fight the FFA on it, and... Um, 
you know, got nowhere. We did have a subsidy for two years or three years, I think, but it wasn't half as much as what it cost us to, to run it. So we are put in a bad position in that way. And like I said, 300,000 is two very good players that we're missing out on. Yeah. yeah top, of the top of the ladder. Top of the ladder. Yeah. Top of the ladder. <laughs> top of the ladder. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, just want to jump back into the Asian stuff quickly. Um, hypothetically speaking, if we were to expand into that region, what would be your 10-year vision? How would you see things playing out and... Well, I'd, uh, now that expansion's already happened and two teams are in, so that's 12 now, uh, I wouldn't expand any more in Australia. Um, I believe they got 23,000 people in Auckland. Um, I don't know if that's a city they're looking at, uh, but that to me, if they got 23,000 people there to a game the other day, Wellington played there, uh, maybe that's a city, I don't know. But uh, uh, I would see us testing it out with Perth Glory versus a couple of teams and then um, having one in Jakarta, uh, one in KL, one in Singapore, one in uh, Manila. Um, And uh, I think you will see uh, an instant boost in the ratings and the derbies. When Malaysia plays Singapore at the moment, they get 80,000 people. Uh, So there's intense rivalry between the two countries. Same with Jakarta. Uh, sorry, Indonesia and uh, Malaysia and, and the like. So those derbies will be massive games themselves. Oh, yeah. They might not rate fantastically here. People will be interested, obviously, but they might not rate fantastic, but they'll rate the, uh, the in Asia. And once you're in Asia, did you know that almost a billion people watched the Asian Champions League final last year? I Jeez. believe. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? A billion. The amount of shirts they must sell, Man United shirts, Liverpool shirts, yeah. all that. It's, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that that's exciting. So you can see why I'm so um, excited um, that uh, this type of thing can happen. Uh, I think the uh, owners um, will get together after the the league is split. We think it will be. Uh, there's meetings going on right now. I'm on the committee to have a new model uh, going forward from the 1st of July. We have to report by the end of uh, March. Uh, and I'm hoping it's a complete split like the EPL uh, and when the owners would then run run the league. And then what we will do is look at these sorts of things going forward. Yeah, It's not unanimous. I mean, I'm one owner. Uh, I've probably three owners uh, love the idea. So it's got to be uh, of the current owners. Uh, so it's really got to be... Um, uh, really thought out and talked about but if you don't have a vision it never will happen so i've got that vision and i hope it does come to fruition um in my lifetime yeah brilliant um now not sure if you're at liberty to talk about this and whatever you, you know feel free to answer it how you like um but are you able to discuss at all about whether andy Keo might be sticking around Next season, and similarly with Diego Castro, he, he sort of you guys look at his contract each year in yeah, the season. Yeah, look, uh, Diego's um, made it clear at the beginning of the season this was his last season. Uh, he's since changed his mind and said, "Oh, look, I will tell you in May," like he has every other year. <laughs> so uh, it's gone from a no, this was going to be his last season to you know things are happening at this club, and uh, the Asian Champions League looks almost locked in. And that's something he try at. Uh, say we're ninety something percent. Everyone knows I'm Fornaroli. He'll become an Australian citizen. Yep. And so will Andy Keo. So that would be a very formidable Asian Champions League team. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, I personally think Keo will stay. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, he's happy with the contract we'd offered him. Um, so. It's up to, to him now to just ink it. Um, for Naroli, I think there's a few little issues left. We've made him a contract over. It's been in the press. Everyone knows that. We're just waiting on on, on a signature. I don't think he's discussing any, with any other club, so I think that will be a foregone conclusion, but we don't know yet. Yeah. So we can't confirm it until we have the press conference and say yes. Uh, but Diego w- will wait until uh, respect his uh, views and uh, like we have every other year. Uh, it was only that very f- – after the first season that he said no, he didn't want to come back. I flew over there to Madrid, met him and his agent, 
and talked him into it. So that was the second season. But he's loved it ever since. His kids have got ochre accents. Um, <laughs> nice. So uh, so that's fantastic. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, the lifestyle obviously must be a real sort of. It is for some. Uh, it is for some, but um, living in Spain is pretty good lifestyle. Pretty good too. That's <laughs> true. And, 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 and according to him, it's half the cost. So uh, <laughs> it's much cheaper to live in Spain than it is in Australia. Yeah. But, but no, he does love it here. But yeah. uh, the lifestyle in Spain, with uh, when you've got some money behind you, is fantastic. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of Spanish players, or a lot of players in Spain that'd be copying a lot of the sort of the fame. So the yeah, cameras and stuff. Like of you. It, it's difficult. Yeah. I mean, he he was under the radar, uh, but he you know he played two hundred old La Liga games first mm. first grade. So, but under the radar, looked just like Wandy. I mean, he's been a surprise packet. You take him out of the side, you notice he's gone, but you don't notice he's there. Mm. But everything he does on the pitch is fantastic. Right, he's on ninety percent pass accuracy. He's, I think, first in our team in intercepts. Uh, so, but you just don't notice him, and everyone when I mention him, go, "Oh yeah, he did have a good game." Oh yeah, so you know, um, he's another Spaniard. Uh, hopefully, he can stay again next year. Uh, so yeah, there's people in our team that are unheralded. Uh, Dino, for example, was told at the beginning of the season, "You're you're our number three or four and I think he started fifteen times. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's fantastic for Dino, and um, yeah, he he doesn't want to lose his spot to to Granty or to Tommy. Yeah. No, he's been solid. What a unit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just wants to get that goal, though, as you can see. Yeah. Desperate to get that goal. Yeah, I saw him yesterday. He was uh, he was definitely around the area on a lot of those corners. And Yeah. Well, uh, Lowry's got his. So uh, remember that one? That was a fantastic yeah. header. So Dino now just wants to catch up. That's brilliant. It's good to have that. <laughs> yeah, it is. No, it, it is indeed. But, yeah, so, look, uh, I think next year, uh, even more formidable, and as we all know, we're talking to Bonavazio as well. Uh, that's been in the press. So, look, uh, he hasn't quite settled, but, you know, players might leave. I mean, if Economides gets a fantastic European contract, um, it's in his contract that he goes. So, you know, we made a decision, I did, 14 years ago, if a player wants to go, he has to go. Mm. You don't want to hold them back. Otherwise, they resent you, and uh, if they come back to Australia, they won't come back to your club. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's in the contract, though. So, look, you know, he um, uh, doesn't want to talk about it, obviously, but we know through his agent that it's been offers, and at the moment he's uh, uh, focusing just on getting us to the grand final. Yeah. Do you think there may be, uh, speculating a little bit, but uh, do you think there may be a little bit of a hesitancy on his part to go back to Europe so soon, maybe consolidate with at least another solid season over here. That's the uh, that's the view of the coaching staff. Um, but in the end, he's a young player. Um, you can break a leg. Anything can happen to you in your career. It's such a short career in in any sport. Yeah. So you take every opportunity that you get given. I believe. Yeah. Uh, so if he gets a club that's a Premier League club or a La Liga club or a Bundesliga club, you know, I'd jump out if it was me. So I don't blame anyone else that would as well. Yeah. But will he get better as a, another year in the A League? Um, I think so. But yeah, you know, it's not our call. Yeah. It's his call. Absolutely. That's a that's a great way to go about it. And um, absolutely, I agree with you. Keeping the players' ambitions, uh, you know, f- first and foremost. Um, it's just important. You don't want to have a player sticking around that doesn't want to be there, and that's just gonna yeah you know, trickle over into their performances, and it's just it's just gonna be a nightmare. So it is indeed. I mean, uh, you saw the situation when uh, Jamie McLaren, for example, wanted to leave three or four years ago. Now, uh, the, Kenny Lowe, the coach at the time, didn't want him to go. It was so acrimonious for that six week period where Kenny. And then Kenny eventually just said he's causing so many problems, let him go. And I had a big beef with uh, Taggart, as you remember, uh, last year. I mean, I called him a liar. Um, he tried to; he was going to sue me. But he, <laughs> told, he told us he was going to wait until uh, we found out who the coach was going to be. And he didn't. He'd already signed uh, with Brisbane and it got leaked and we were made to look stupid. And, um, you know, I call it as I see it. Uh, yeah. But players... If they don't want to be there, it is best to let them go. Yeah. It's a funny thing, isn't it, in football? You sort of, um, 
you know, managing real life human assets that have feelings and emotions and oh, yeah. ambitions. It, it, and it's difficult. I mean, um, you know, I've had players and I won't mention their names crying in my office because uh, of various things. And, you know, it, it, it is difficult. It, it, it's a professional environment. They, their livelihoods are dependent on it. And um, you've got to make tough calls, you know. Same with coaches. I mean, I think I've had to um, get rid of a few. Um, and it's not easy. I mean, Kenny Lowe and I were great mates, still are, thank God. Um, so, yeah, that was very difficult to say to, to Kenny, right, it's time, time's up. But uh, I gave him his chance. He loves uh, what he's doing now and mm. now he's the assistant to, to Graham Arnold and... You know, if he didn't get the gig at Perth Glory, he wouldn't get that gig. So, you know, he's fulfilled an ambition, uh, helped him along the way. But at some point, you've got to make a call. And sometimes you might think he's a great coach, but someone else could do a better job. Yeah. And that's what uh, I thought. Yeah. Well, I think the Glory are very lucky to have you and yeah. you've been committed to the club for a long time. And um, I know you've financially, uh, you've, you've put a lot into the club and, um, you know, I think, you're definitely probably seeing your just rewards now. Uh, and I certainly think that the FFA could uh, heed your advice in a, in a big way. Um, I think that they need to be a little bit more op optimistic and, uh, you know, forward thinking rather than seemingly conservative and, uh, and almost backwards. But, you know, um, without knowing the ins and outs, I won't make too many comments about it, but yeah, Alex, uh, Asian expansion would be very exciting. I yeah, think. look, and d d didn't mention we haven't talked about it, but uh, now that we've got a beautiful stadium, Chelsea came out last year. We yep. we uh, the stadium closed the doors at lunchtime. Said it was a sellout. It was pouring down with rain. We got fifty, almost fifty-seven thousand. That's the third highest at that stadium, and we've had the Eagles and Dockers playing there and derbies and everything. So that's fantastic for our sport. Uh, we've got a juicy two games coming up uh, this year. We managed to bring out Manchester United. And people just don't realise how difficult uh, that was. This is the first time Man U have uh, had a training base in Australia playing two games. They're staying 10 days. That's never happened before. They fly in maybe a day and a half, two days, and they're out. Yep. So this is the first time that's happened. So it's a huge coup to, for, for Perth Glory, for the state, for the stadium owners. Uh, and for football lovers. And now if people don't really embrace that, I think the Leeds game is slightly outselling the Glory game. Uh, and if you're a, a big fan of the EPL, you remember the 70s and 80s, they were bitter rivals. Yeah. And I think they haven't played each other for uh, so many years now. I can't remember the number, seven or eight years. So that'll be the first time they'll play each other. And Leeds look like going up. Uh, into the Premier League next year. So that's going to be a massive clash. Yeah. Uh, but that, what a feast of football that we've got on the 13th and 17th of July. And uh, we're in the middle of it, Perth Glory, little old Perth Glory, uh, <laughs> after, you know, doing quite well against Chelsea. And we're chasing the other red team um, for the following year. So let's hope that that comes off and we make this a yearly event when we can get a big club from Europe to come out. Yeah, totally. That's are, huge. Are you a Man U supporter as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so you're going to both games. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> That'd yeah. be brilliant. And it's a full squad because it's a uh, full training. It's a shame there's no uh, Mourinho. I, I, I like to see him cry. <laughs> <laughs> when when <laughs> Perth Glory beat yeah. Um, He's yeah. a laugh. But uh, did you see what happened to uh, the Chelsea goalkeeper last night? No. no. Oh. Haven't you seen the news? I saw a he thumbnail. I saw, saw a thumbnail. I didn't click he, on he, it. Uh, he refused to come off. Oh, right. yes. Right. Okay. Right. I saw a headline, right? Yeah. Now, can you imagine Popovich if someone refused to come off? Get would he off. play? Would he? And this is their £130 million pound signing. He's, yeah. Uh, this, this, I think he's Spanish, the goalkeeper. He refused to come off. And when the Sergio Aguero took the penalty, it was a cup game, took the penalty. It was such a slow, soft penalty. It just went underneath him. Ooh. Any other goalkeeper would have taken that. Just watch it. It's, it's all over YouTube at the moment. I'm going to check that out. <laughs> it, it, it's unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. And he was furious. So, uh, and I met the guy when he was out, out here. It was, <laughs> first thing he said, I didn't even know where Perth was because he signed the contract <laughs> to join Chelsea and he got told three days later he was in Perth. Wow. <laughs> in Scotland? <laughs> Refusing yeah. to get subbed is something I might do in our Sunday league games. Yeah. yeah. A few weeks. I might do Watch that. it. It is the most bizarre 
ending to a game that you'll ever see. And he missed the penalty. Um, save. <sighs> missed the penalty save. Jesus. Yeah, so uh, a bit of, bit of talk about football. All right. I guess that probably happens, you know, with these, some, some of these guys on the on the big money. It's like, ah, it's just all sorts of things that could go on. <laughs> I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, it's 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 bizarre to watch. But uh, is there anything you wanted to talk about? Promote? No, not now? really. Um, you know, we we always have this perennial problem with uh, people saying, "Oh, I rocked up to the game and it's thirty nine dollars at the gate, and that's too expensive." And you know, our just join up and be a member. You don't have to be a season full season member and buy a two hundred dollar ticket, two hundred and fifty. Yeah. You can buy a three game pack or a five game pack and it's only like twenty two dollars a ticket. So you're not paying thirty nine dollars at the gate because out of the thirty nine dollars at the gate, most of it doesn't come to the glory. So you're paying ticketing agents, you're paying the the stadium, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's I always implore people just to buy if you think we're going to have a bad season. You want to pay for the whole lot. Buy a three or five game pack. But the more members we have, the more uh, the better coaches we'll get and the better players we'll get because yep. it's all about membership. Get around it. And um, I know, so the FFA, uh, the, oh, do they set pricing on the grand final tickets? Unfortunately, they do. Uh, we get nothing. We get nothing for winning the league other than the really? Asian Champion League spot. <laughs> yeah, there's no prize money. Uh there will be when there's an independent A-League, I'll tell you. But at the moment, there's not. So, yeah, they do set the prices and I've implored them. I've even put an article out to make sure that they know. There's no use everyone complaining about a $40 ticket than jacking up the grand final tickets to 90 Yeah. Or, 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 or more. I mean, I think they should stick it around 25 to maximum 30 uh, for especially the tiers uh, that, that are there. Maybe the semi-final the same. Maybe it's 25 or $30. Um but they shouldn't charge uh, much more. And um, they made a big mistake a few years ago and only, uh, uh, I think they're 20000 less than what was expected because they do that. Because it's a big money spinner for them. The clubs don't get it. So I'm hoping that they see the sense and keep it to a reasonable level. I'd love to see 50000 there for the grand final. Yeah. Love to. That'd be fantastic. fantastic. Mm. That'd be my first time at the stadium as well, so... Oh, really? It's oh, amazing. You didn't go to Chelsea? No, 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 I didn't. No, you should, no. Even as a Man U fan, you should have gone to, <laughs> to, to Barrack for us beating them. Yeah, boy. It's incredible. You stand at the top tier and you sort of look over and you feel you feel a bit scared. You feel like you might fall off look, or something. It's yeah. like a cliff. I walked around the whole stadium and virtually from every spot you had a good good. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, totally. it's, a, it's a well-built stadium and for, for football. I mean... They've got uh, State of Origin there this year. Uh, they've got, which is fantastic. They got the Blaiso Cup, so they have got other rectangle sports there. And they've got two of our games, Man U games. So, look, it, it is well built, set up for that. And like I said, I walked around the whole lot because <laughs> they put me in the opposite uh, side of the stadium to the Chelsea chairman. So I had to walk all the way around. But I looked out through the, and it had a great view from everywhere. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Uh, it's a great spot. Alrighty. Thank you very much, Tony, for coming no in. No worries, guys. Giving us a down low, having a bit of a chat. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. We've definitely enjoyed it. Um, yeah. No worries. Thank good you very much for having me and good luck for uh, your podcast going forward. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs>